Mr. Committee will come to order. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to uh, welcome everyone today as the committee meets to consider two important pieces of legislation. First, the committee will consider H.R. 4138, the Enforce Act. This legislation gives Congress standing to sue the President for failing to dis discharge his constitutional duty to faithfully execute the laws of this nation. Today, courts have created their own rules that make it difficult for Congress to challenge the President whenever the President chooses to ignore existing laws. As the institution charged with writing the laws that govern our nation, Congress should have the ability to ensure that the President implements and enforces the laws that it creates that are signed into law by the President, and he should faithfully execute those laws as they have been passed, or to advise us accordingly. Secondly, the committee will consider H.R. 3973, the Faithful Execution of the Law Act. The bill directs the Attorney General to notify Congress whenever a federal official establishes or implements a policy to refrain from enforcing existing federal law. Currently, the Attorney General is required to notify Congress of such a policy only if the Department of Justice refuses to enforce a law based on constitutional objections. Today's bill would expand the reporting requirements to include all federal agencies that refuse to enforce federal law for any reasons, not just constitutional objections. Both of these bills aim to restore the important checks, system of checks and balances that the framers of our Constitution envisioned when establishing our government. These are federal laws, not suggestions. And the, federal, the executive branch has a constitutional responsibility to evenly apply every law not just those that they choose to agree with. Recently, the Obama administration has made several unilateral decisions to selectively enforce previously enacted laws without pursuing any legislative process and has issued several executive actions which directly oppose long-established federal statutes. More recently, President Obama delayed for the second time the employer mandated mandate contained in the Affordable Care Act. House Republicans have long said that such action is necessary. We've been encouraging the President through legislation in this body and in conversations with the American people. But that should be done only through corrective legislation, not through executive fiat instead of joining with Congress to enact the necessary reforms to this disastrous health care law, the President single-handedly took it upon himself to ignore a law which he helped write himself and which is named after him. This was done outside of the law and was done outside the framework of what we believe is a constitutional requirement. The bills before us today take important action to prevent the troublesome expansion of executive power and to provide the American people with the certainty that the law, laws Congress exact, enact serve as the law of the land. I want to thank my colleagues for being here today, and I'd like to defer, if I can, to the gentleman from Florida, Judge Hastings, for any comments that he would choose to make at this time. Mr. The gentleman Chairman, is recognized. I indicated to you earlier that I would have uh, no opening uh, uh, remarks because I perceived I didn't say this part to you, that what we're about to do is a colossal waste of time. Gentleman has been extended time and, in fact, had an opportunity to express his opinion. And I respect and appreciate the gentleman for his comments. Today we welcome two very important members of this body. One, a senior member from the state of Virginia who uh, serves as the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. And the second is the ranking member on the 
Subcommittee on Constitution and, and Civil Justice, and I welcome both not only Mr. Cohen of Tennessee, but the young chairman of the Judiciary Committee from Virginia, Chairman Goodlatte. Uh, as always, anything you have in writing will be entered into the record without objection, and the gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be at the Rules Committee, particularly when you refer to me as the young chairman of the Judiciary Committee. And uh, thank you for allowing me to testify before the committee today. The two bills that we are here to consider will help restore the separation of powers and prevent the executive branch from circumventing the constitutional limits on its power. These bills, the Enforce the Law Act and the Faithful Execution of the Law Act, allow Congress to challenge executive overreach in the courts and increase accountability and transparency when the executive branch decides not to enforce a law. It is ultimately up to Congress to use the legislative authority it is granted in the Constitution to check the President's overreach and restore balance to our system of government. These two bills are an exercise of that authority. Although no legislation is a perfect solution to the unprecedented unilateral actions of this administration, these bills are a very good first step in Congress's exercise of its authority to ensure that the President faithfully executes the law. Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution declares just that, that the President shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. However, President Obama has failed on several occasions to enforce acts of Congress that he disagrees with for policy reasons and has stretched his regulatory authority to put in place policies that Congress has refused to enact. While President Obama is not the first president to stretch his powers beyond their constitutional limits, executive overreach has accelerated at an alarming rate under his administration. As we learned at the two House Judiciary Committee hearings we held on executive overreach and ways Congress could legislatively enforce the Constitution's Take Care Clause, quote, we are in the midst of a constitutional crisis with sweeping implications for our system of government. There has been a mass gravitational shift of authority to the executive branch that threatens the stability and functionality of our tripartite system, end quote. The Enforce the Law Act and the Faithful Execution of the Law Act will help end the current crisis and restore balance to our system of government. The Enforce the Law Act puts a procedure in place to permit the House or the Senate to authorize a lawsuit against the executive branch for failure to faithfully execute the laws. The legislation also provides for expedited consideration of any such lawsuit first through a three-judge panel at the federal district court level and then for providing for direct appeal to the United States Supreme Court. This legislation is crucial to ensuring that when a lawsuit is brought against the administration to enforce our laws, the courts not only grant Congress standing but also hear the case on an expedited timeline to prevent the president from stalling the litigation until his or her term is up. In addition to overcome Past procedural hurdles, the bill statutorily prevents the courts from using court-created prudential principles as an excuse to avoid making decisions in these important separation of powers cases. The second bill we are here to consider, the Faithful Execution of the Law Act, will help prevent executive overreach and require greater disclosure when it occurs. This common sense legislation ensures that there is greater transparency and disclosure regarding the executive branch's enforcement of federal law. The Justice Department is currently required by law to report to Congress whenever it decides to adopt a policy to refrain from enforcing federal law on grounds that the law in question is unconstitutional. The Faithful Execution of the Law Act strengthens this provision by requiring the Attorney General to report to Congress whenever a federal official establishes or implements a formal or informal policy to refrain from enforcing a federal law. It also requires the Attorney General to report on the reason for the non-enforcement. I urge the committee to adopt an appropriate rule for consideration of these bills on the floor. Passage of this legislation is essential if Congress is going to play an active role in overseeing that the separation of powers between the branches is maintained and that the President is faithfully executing the laws. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Elmer Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your uh, welcoming me here to this committee. Yes, sir. Uh, First, before we get to the substance of these bills, with all due respect to the young chairman, and I don't necessarily attribute this to his youth, 
but uh, um, there was a lack of deliberative uh, process for in these, passing these bills. Uh, the Judiciary Committee did not have a single legislative hearing on either of these bills, and um, nor was there a subcommittee markup on either bills. The bills just kind of manifested themselves in the full committee for a markup, which is you know, somewhat unusual, and maybe it could be attributed to youth. Uh, in fact, the final text of the bill was not even made available until just days before the markup last week. Uh, the committee filed its report only on Friday, literally just two days before the markup. And so while the, the, my friend, the chairman, says these were co are common sense bills, I, I would submit that they are very creative because they kind of manifested themselves from places that were unknown before, kind of Columbus-like journeys into law and, and, and into politics and policy. When you take into consideration the fact that, that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle provided only this minimum process regarding H.R. 4138, it is clear that the whole legislative process concerning the bill has not been uh, as it should have been and traditionally is. This, the process surrounding the bill um, puts into question how the how the House, house does operate, but uh, and, uh, and I would submit that it was a disservice to the American people, but since it disregards entirely the Senate in working jointly to bring lawsuits unless the House do it on its own, which right now the House can, and the Senate can only act on their own when they're defending their own institution, like on uh, um, people in, uh, being held in contempt, but not bringing lawsuits. And, and to say that this is part of the tri changing the tripartite system or reinforcing it, really the, the whole idea of the tripartite system is the legislative branch, the House and Senate working together and this doesn't foresee the House and Senate working together, but the two branches operating independently. Accordingly, the fact that the committee process wasn't respected, there were no markups in the subcommittee, nor hearings in the whole committee, nor much timely opportunity to study and, and comment, uh, is in kind of keeping with, and maybe the medium is the message and the way it comes out and what it does and disturbs the process of working with the Senate as a legislative branch. Uh, all of this should be considered in light of the fact that H.R. 4138 uh, raises fundamentally complex issues of constitutional law and separation of powers. Uh, turning to the substance of the Enforce Act, this bill, like so many others we've considered, is uh, a solution in search of an uh, imaginary problem. As was made clear during the two full committee oversight hearings that we held on the Constitution's Take Care Clause, uh, the President has, in fact, fully met his obligation to faithfully execute the laws. So let us acknowledge what this legislation is really about. It's simply another attempt by the majority to prevent the president from implementing duly enacted legislative initiatives uh, that they oppose. Um, and sometimes when he doesn't want to move forward, there are areas, as the chairman made clear, that they agree with, like on the employer mandate. So while it's process versus substance, it's in Yiddish it would be called chutzpah to complain about something you want, or in law it's a stopper. But nevertheless, we're going through and criticizing the president for doing the things that the, that the majority would have wanted. Allowing flexibility in the implementation of a new program, even when, where the statute mandates a specific deadline, is neither unusual nor a constitutional violation. Rather, it's the reality of administering sometimes complex programs and is part and parcel of the president's duty to take care that he faithfully execute laws. This has been especially true with respect to the Affordable Care Act, a major undertaking, and may I submit with all uh, due respect and, and, and regard for the, for the chairman, uh, I don't think the, the, the chairman said the, this bill was named for the president. I don't, it's called the Affordable Care Act and Patient Protection Act, and I think the people who named it for the president were not really doing it for the president's benefit, and I don't think the president or his allies gave him that name. But in fact, I call it Pelosi Care, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, uh, this has been especially true with respect to the Affordable Care Act. The President's decision to extend compliance dates to help phase in the Act is not a novel tactic. And even though not a single court has ever concluded that reasonable delay in implementing a complex law constitutes a violation of the Take Care Clause, the majority insists there's a constitutional problem. Additionally, the exercise of enforcement discretion is a traditional power of the executive. There's so many laws on the books and we are taking money away from government and the ability to have the personnel able to enforce the laws. You can't enforce them all. It's impossible. Uh, the decision to defer deportation of young adults, for example, who were brought to the United States as children, the Dreamers, uh, is a classic example of such exercise and discretion. It's no surprise the Supreme Court has consistently held the exercise of that such discretion is a function of the President's power 
under the Take Care Clause. And as the court held in Heckler versus Cheney, uh, not Cheney, Cheney, maybe it was Cheney, an agency's decision not to prosecute or enforce, uh, whether through civil or criminal process, is a decision generally committed to an agency's absolute discretion. Even assuming there's a problem to address, H.R. 4138 is itself flawed because it violates fundamental separation of powers principles and may be unconstitutional as applied. The Enforce Act will essentially allow federal courts to second-guess decisions by the executive branch in a potentially vast range of areas that are committed under the Constitution to the executive branch's sole discretion. For example, Section 508 of the Foreign Assistance Act prohibits the executive branch from assisting a country whose leader was deposed uh, in a coup. If the President and the Secretary of State were to continue providing assistance to countries like Ukraine or Egypt because they've determined these regime changes that occurred did not qualify as coups, just one House of Congress under this bill could sue the President if it believed the President was failing to faithfully execute the Foreign Assistance uh, Act. And God knows what happened before the Civil War with the fugitive, around that time with the Fugitive Slave Act. Somebody might have wanted to sue the President for not enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act. I know our founders were great men, and I revere them greatly and look forward to the dinner tonight to learn more about Thomas uh, James Madison, but many of them owned slaves and didn't allow women to vote. So the founders were not without faults in their system and the way they looked at government and society. The um, prudent use of legislative and judicial resources should be used, and, and using these acts doesn't seem prudent. I have an amendment which would explicitly exempt action dealing with foreign affairs, which is within the province of the president, and we need to be and normally are, supportive and unified in foreign affairs as a nation. That's just historical, although we're getting away from history some today, I think. Additionally, it's highly unlikely that Congress could satisfy the standing requirements of Article Three of the Constitution that must be met in order to take a take force clause action. To meet this requirement, a plaintiff under the Supreme Court's 97 decision in Reigns versus Byrd must show, among other things, that has suffered a concrete and particularized injury, injury amounting only to an alleged violation of a right to have the government act in accordance with law, which is what the Enforce Act contemplates, is not judicially recognizable as an Article III standing uh, for the purpose of standing. This is in stark contrast to cases where Congress has sought to protect a fundamental power, as I said earlier, like its subpoena authority, where Congress can act on its own, each House, to go to court and enforce its authority, rather than a, a general area of saying that the law is not being enforced. Uh, in subpoena enforcement cases, courts have found standing for one House of Congress to sue because of a specific legislative prerogative that was at stake, constituting a sufficiently concrete injury to Congress to confer Article III standing. Article III, because there's indeed a, a, a harm there. Article III standing requirements enforce the Constitution's separation of powers principles. Congress cannot simply legislate away these constitutional standing requirements, which our founding fathers did have the basis for, uh, and as the majority is trying to deal with the Enforce Act. The American people expect their government to, to work to address a whole host of issues this House refuses to address from enhancing environmental protections to ensuring worker safety to helping those struggling to achieve the American dream to creating jobs. Rather than wasting precious time on this bill, we should be working to address real, not imaginary challenges facing our nation, which are great. But instead, we're forced to deal with a patently flawed bill that's absolutely no chance of becoming law. And uh, that is why a number of my colleagues on have recognition of the numerous defects have offered amendments, which I hope your committee will take and make an order. Uh, I hope, uh, appreciate the opportunity to testify on this bill, and I would like to refer to the second bill at this time, too, the H.R. 3973, and it suffers from the same flaws as I mentioned in H.R. 4138. Concerns about the legislative process used to consider it, no hearings, uh, no markups at the subcommittee level, and, and, and the fact that it's based on the same false premise. Uh, there are other flaws, though. To begin with, H.R. 3973 would impose burdensome and wasteful requirements on the Justice Department to the detriment of its law enforcement functions. Justice Department basically be making reports on a constant basis to Congress rather than doing the job it's otherwise required to do, which, of course, then would have to be forced to do because they weren't doing it because they were doing this new job. Section 530D of Title 28 of the United States Code already requires the Attorney General to report to Congress any instance in which the Attorney General or any Justice Department official, quote, establishes or implements a formal or informal policy, unquote, against enforcing, applying, or administering a provision of federal law on the grounds that such provision is unconstitutional. Current law, therefore, allows an administration to refuse to enforce a law in the extremely limited circumstance where law is deemed unconstitutional. No other reason is sufficient. The bill before today, however, strikes the limiting language on the grounds that such provision is unconstitutional and replaces the requirement only to state the grounds for such policy. 
This override of current law creates a dangerous open -ended invitation for any administration to refuse to enforce any law for any reason whatsoever. And this is just one reason why this bill should be rejected. In addition, H.R. 3973 fails to define exactly which individuals the federal government will qualify as a federal officer. As a result of this oversight, the Attorney General will have to review enforcement decisions by hundreds, if not thousands, of individuals who work in the executive branch and may qualify as officers in order to determine whether decisions trigger the reporting requirements. Such a burden would drain the limited resources justice has to fulfill its law enforcement mission and protect us uh, as part of its job. Uh, we've got amendments on this bill as well, which I hope you consider and, and, and support. Uh, and uh, further, I would thank you again for the opportunity to make the statements and yield back the balance of my time if there is such. Thank you very much, gentlemen from Tennessee. Uh, not only is welcome here and, and his points that he chooses to make uh, <clears throat> would uh, lend themselves to uh, a credible argument, and I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, I view that uh, what you're trying to do here today on behalf of, of the United States Congress, the House of Representatives, and perhaps maybe the majority party, and also to that perhaps Republicans, is to find a way to discuss with the President of the United States and the American people uh, a rational way to move forward uh, on uh, what might be uh, people who are trying to millions of people who are trying to follow the law, comply with the law, and make arrangements to ensure that they follow those processes. I worked for 16 years for a telecommunications company called AT&T where we followed the law. That was well understood by every employee. And I think what I envision what you're trying to do is to give any American a fighting chance to understand that if a president, and they come and they go, and attorney generals come and go, and perhaps others in the government come and go, if they are going to make a change in how they administer the law, that they give fair notice to people, especially larger issues like perhaps what might be called Obamacare. I call it Hillary Care. But what might be known as Obamacare, and that it impacts millions of people, and it, 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 uh, its scope needs to be well understood so that people can comply with the law. Uh, and, uh, just a background I have, not as a lawyer, but an understanding that when federal judges disagree with certain elements of the law, notwithstanding perhaps Judge Hastings has spoken about this a few times, that through the judicial conference they came back and had negotiations with members of Congress on how they were supposed to perform their duties. It might be uh, uh, changes uh, about uh, statutory or, or sentencing requirements. And they actually came back and tried to understand more about a way they wanted to administer what they did in support of the law. I view what you're trying to do today is to say you'd like to develop a mechanism whereby the President of the United States gives consent or acknowledges back to the body uh, how, how they're going to rule on the law or at least adjudicate the law or look at the law and to make it fair for everybody and to offer some bit of uh, critique back, not just to Congress, but also to the American people about how they might do things. I think this is perfectly rational. Mr. Chairman? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I, I concur with your assessment of its rationality, and it simply builds upon a law that already exists, and that law uh, requires that the uh, Attorney General notify the Congress any time the executive branch makes a decision not to defend a law it deems to be unconstitutional. And, in fact, that system, in my opinion, worked the way the process is supposed to with regard to the Defense of Marriage Act. The, uh, Attorney General advised the Congress they weren't going to defend that. That gave the Congress, in, in this case the House of Representatives, the opportunity uh, to uh, seek to enter that case and defend the constitutionality uh, of that provision. And while a five to four decision ruled against the House in uh, their defense of that, uh, and, I, and I think a wrong-headed decision, nonetheless, that process worked. So all we're asking is that that be expanded to any time the administration makes uh, a policy decision uh, to not enforce other areas of the law 
uh, that are based, those laws are based upon the Constitution. So if they're not going to enforce them, uh, notwithstanding the president's duty to faithfully execute the laws, they should. And when my good friend, the gentleman from Tennessee, says that this will inundate uh, the Justice Department with reports on a constant basis, I would remind the gentleman and everyone here that that would only occur if the Justice Department and other agencies of the government were constantly failing to enforce the law. If there are only a few instances, there will only be a few reports. If there are many instances, as there have been many complaints in recent years, then uh, that would be a burden, but I would suggest it be a well worthwhile burden for the Congress to know about uh, the fact that its legislative authority, its Article I authority under the Constitution, uh, is being further usurped. And as I indicated in my remarks today, and I've said many other times, this didn't start with President Obama. But uh, the massive uh, uh, use of prosecutorial discretion, for example, to cover hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, when prosecutorial discretion has always been known to be handled on a narrow case-by-case -case basis, uh, is one example uh, of that. There are many others, some of which I cited in my testimony. Thank you very much. I appreciate both of you being here. Uh, now defer to the gentlewoman, Ms. Fox. The gentlewoman is recognized. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize uh, to you and my colleagues. I've been sitting on an, on an airplane in the airport for several hours this afternoon, which is why I'm late, and I have no questions. Thank you. Gentleman yields back time. Gentleman, Massachusetts, recognized. No, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for yielding to me, and I just want to associate myself with the opening remarks of my colleague, Mr. Hastings. Um, you know, um, this place is becoming... Uh, you know, this Congress is becoming a place where trivial issues get debated passionately and important ones not at all. And there are so many things that we need to get done, uh, everything from extending unemployment uh, insurance benefits to the long-term unemployed to raising the minimum wage to passing a comprehensive immigration reform package uh, to uh, passing a pay equity bill. I mean, to, to actually do things that might be a benefit uh, to the people we represent. And, you know, I get it. You guys don't like uh, uh, what has been referred to as Obamacare, which you call Hillary Care, which I call Romney Care. Um, but, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, get over it. We're doing it. We, we repealed it, uh, 51 repeals. Uh, I think it, that's a pretty good indication that, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, that law is here to stay. And maybe uh, it might be a better use of everybody's time for us to all work together to make it work. Uh, the best, uh, best way we possibly can. But this, this stuff we're doing here, it's just, it is so frustrating to come back after being home and listening to some of the concerns that people have, um, and then we come back and we do this. Uh, and um, you know, I, I, I regret it very much. I think we are wasting, wasting time here. And uh, but it is what it is. This is not about legislating. It's about political statements. You're in charge of the show, so you can do whatever you want. But. Uh, but I think the record ought to reflect that some of us really do think that uh, we can spend our time more productively doing something else. And with that, I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Utah is recognized. Gentleman does not seek time. Uh, Judge Hastings, do you seek time? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman is recognized. Chairman, good luck. Under, under this proposal, um, can you tell me what would constitute a federal officer? What would constitute a federal a officer? A federal officer. Well, the, a, a, a federal officer is defined uh, in other sections of the law. But the point that I'm making and asking you to reply to is that this uh, proposed legislation allows uh, that federal officers, uh, a federal officer can sue the President of the United States. Who is that? There are a whole lot of federal offices. No, all sir. Over the place. Only um, upon the vote of uh, one uh, of the two legislative bodies, the House or the Senate, uh, would this enable uh, a lawsuit to be brought against uh, uh, the president or an other officer of the executive branch. Is there any reason in the legislation? A lot of times when we do categorize um, uh, persons that may file a lawsuit, uh, is there any reason why you did not define federal officer? No, because the uh, fact of the matter is that when lawsuits are brought, uh, as in the case of uh, uh, the uh, contempt uh, uh, 
uh, and the failure to produce uh, documents on the part of the Attorney General of the United States, that the lawsuit was brought against the Attorney General of the United States. Uh, when lawsuits are brought by private citizens uh, against various agencies of the government, they're not necessarily brought against the President of the United States. They're often brought against the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services or the Chairman of the uh, Federal Election Commission or a whole host of other different federal government officers that are often finding themselves defendants in lawsuits. Among the first questions that any federal judge asks um, a litigant seeking um, uh, to have a matter uh, decided by the court is um, uh, determine for me uh, what your standing is. That's correct. Do you feel um, uh, that um, uh, you have uh, that base covered on the subject of standing in the proposed legislation? Well, there are two bills. One bill only deals with notice. It doesn't address the issue of standing. The Enforce the Law Act, however, uh, is designed to address the fact that when courts look at the standing of parties, in this case uh, uh, an entire House of the, of the Congress, the uh, fact of the matter is uh, there are two types of standing. One is standing that's found in the United States Constitution. Surely we can't change that by legislation. Uh, but the other is court-made standing uh, based upon the court's precedence. And the Supreme Court, uh, in uh, recent decisions with regard to the standing issue, uh, have made it clear that uh, they would recognize that the Congress, uh, which uh, has the power to establish uh, all of the courts except for the Supreme Court, uh, does also have the power uh, to, in the case of its own lawsuits, waive that standing uh, that is not founded in the Constitution. So that's the basis of, of this uh, legislation, uh, and uh, that uh, uh, the gentleman uh, may guffaw, but the courts have uh, uh, spent uh, a number of cases examining that. And, you got that uh, I would, right. I would commend, in I order would commend for to the gentleman his careful uh, examination. Let me reclaim my time and put to you another way of looking at standing. In order for a person to have standing before the court, the plaintiff is going to have to plead an injury in fact. You bet. Okay? Members of Congress have standing against the executive branch, and members of Congress have sued uh, the executive branch of uh, government at least a lot of times, and more recently, uh, some senator filed some lawsuit against uh, the executive branch, and I'm not considering that anything unusual. Um, but they have that power uh, as in their role as a member where there exists either a personal injury or a member's seat is in some way um, uh, my question, or an institutional injury um, uh, that is not some abstract and widely dispersed and what uh, amounts to uh, nullification. Nothing in this bill creates Article III standing. Am I correct about that? This uh, bill does two things. One, it Can you gives, answer me yes or no and then... Well, I think the answer would require more than a yes or no. Please then, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, it does two things. One, in the case of where an entire body of the Congress makes a determination to bring a lawsuit, it provides for an expedited process because while you're correct that all the time people bring lawsuits, sometimes members of Congress individually or even groups of them, they do not have the, uh, the ability to create... Uh, an expedited process. Secondly, uh, the Congress does, however. Uh, secondly, uh, this would, as I indicated earlier, uh, draw the clear distinction between the standing issues raised in the United States Constitution and further standing issues uh, that have been uh, uh, placed uh, uh, into the process that the courts follow uh, by the courts and not by any statutory provisions in the law. Mm -hmm. This seeks, through legislation, uh, to uh, uh, provide clarity on both those points. Well, let me ask you another way. Can you tell me what the actual, uh, not theoretical or institutional injury uh, to a member of Congress in this case is, so that if this matter were to go uh, to the Supreme Court, um, as I predict it won't, because it ain't going to even go to the United States Senate and have nothing done to it. But since we're having this exercise, let's carry it to its um, uh, logical determination. 
um, uh, which would be that if you cannot uh, show that actual, not theoretical, um, uh, injury, uh, the court's going to dismiss it for the lack of standing. Now, that happens all the time, Chairman, and you know that, and I would hope uh, that um, uh, you would recognize uh, that while this has a cute little name, um, um, I, I thought of all sorts of um, uh, things I could do to E-N-F-O-R-C-E. Among the things is um, I don't feel here in the United States Congress uh, that we are doing the things um, uh, that uh, the Constitution allows uh, for us. And let's make it very clear about the clause that you are using, the so-called take care clause. That clause arises in the Constitution under Article 2, Section 3 with the following language. He shall, and I'll be damn glad when it will be he or she shall, uh, and maybe we can even improve on Hillary care. Uh, but that said, he shall receive ambassadors and other public ministers, colon. He shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed and shall commission all the officers of the United States. I don't have any um, uh, determination. I know what, what, what you're getting ready to tell me is that the vesting clause doesn't give him discretion. But this particular clause doesn't say anything at all uh, other than a broad determination about what a president of the United States is supposed to do, and that's faithfully execute the law. Let me take that inside the present determination. You all sit here on the Republican side and say that the president isn't faithfully executing the laws. The president and his administration go about their business, and if you were to ask them if they were on a witness stand, what you would get from them is, I'm faithfully executing the law. You just may not like what I'm doing. And that's all this is. And that's all we're getting ready to do with this so-called imperial presidency week. This is asinine. You're, in, in the final analysis, what we're winding up doing is not only denigrating the institution of the presidency as accords um, of the uh, Constitution of the United States, but we're bringing ourselves lower by this continuing harangue back and forth uh, with, with each other. This bill uh, seems like its sole purpose is to vastly expand the powers of the individual chambers of Congress beyond those granted by the Constitution in this article. And it seems like you're trying to create a mechanism to stall constitutional enforcement and decisions of prosecutorial discretion. And if you're doing that, just say that. You know, we have enough angles in this country of your party, uh, and I'm talking to all of you all now, doing everything you can to suppress people's uh, voting. And then you would argue that an attorney general doesn't have a responsibility to determine exactly what it is that's going on in these states and localities with reference to this. Even Justice Scalia in the DOMA case uh, commented about this infringement on separation of powers and indicated, and I quote him, it would create opportunities for dragging the courts into disputes hitherto left uh, for political resol res resolution, uh, and, and that is potentially endless. And he goes on to say, if majorities of both houses of Congress care enough about the matter, they have available innumerable ways to compel executive action without a lawsuit from refusing to confirm presidential appointments appointments to the elimination of funding, and that was in Doma. But listen, let me tell you all something. I'm the only person in the history of Western civilization, with the exception of a judge in Australia named Cook, that was impeached by a body that went on to serve in that body. In Judge Cook's case, the Parliament of Australia refused, after he was found not guilty, charged with the same thing that I was, refused to go forward, uh, as I believe and as we argued to the United States Supreme Court on at least two occasions, um, uh, that this Congress, uh, in its form um, in 1989, should have done. 
So I have a lot of experience with this Article 2, Section 3, uh, Chairman Goodlatte, uh, and uh, it causes me great angst um, uh, that we are here wasting our time when people uh, have not received their unemployment, when we are not dealing uh, with matters that we could and should be dealing in, uh, with in this Congress. And you know, Steve Cohen, your counterpart who is here, knows, the chairman of this Rules Committee knows, that this particular legislation that we are considering is going nowhere. There's absolutely nowhere. Now, if you all want to run out and have press conferences about your imperial presidency um, um, week, as it were, then go on and do that. Have all the press conferences you want, because it fairly clearly determined that this nation has an ideological divide, and a part of what you all are doing is exercising your majority prerogatives with reference to that ideological bent that you have while this nation is seething with difficulties that need to be addressed by this Congress. Don't you commence to telling me that the take care clause does anything. What you need to do in this Congress is take care that we take care of the responsibilities of the people of this country and that we don't come up here repeatedly as we have during all of this year and as I suspect we will for the remainder of this year. Let's have the November election already. Let's get it over with. And then when that one's over, let's have the 2016 elections already. But don't commence to telling people that you are up here doing anything. You're doing nothing. And I resent it. I yield back my time. Gentlemen, yields Mr. Back Chairman, may I respond? Gentlemen, yields back his time. Uh, I, I will uh, offer the gentleman an opportunity and the gentleman, Mr. Cohen, the gentleman's right I just want to briefly minutes. say that one need only go back as little as six years to see a reversal of the roles with the majority Democrats complaining about uh, a Republican president that they did not feel was enforcing the laws or was expanding the authority of the executive branch. And so here, instead of just complaining about it or some of the other actions that were taken or the press conferences that were held at that time, we brought legislation that would not do anything other than expand and protect the power of the United States Congress to protect its Article I prerogatives. That's what this legislation is about. It's not about press conferences. Uh, and it is a shame that uh, both parties cannot come together and find the correct way to protect Article I powers of the people of this country through their elected representatives. That's what this legislation is about. It is a much better way to go about it than uh, either party has gone about it in the past. And I yield back. I appreciate the gentleman's comments. Mr. Cohen, do you in intend to use such time? No, sir. I the gentleman does not seek time. Uh, I would now defer to the gentleman from uh, Oklahoma, uh, Chairman Cole. Taking advantage of the gentleman from Oklahoma, the uh, gentleman is respected and appreciated for being here. I did not want to bypass him. Does the gentleman from Colorado seek to be recognized? I do, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, and I want to begin, before we get to the topic at hand, uh, and the chairman knows um, he's been up here for, this is the fifth and sixth bill, I believe, from the Judiciary Committee coming to the floor since the Senate passed the Bipartisan Immigration Reform Bill. And I just wanted to ask the chairman about his plans to act on immigration reform uh, in the committee. I know the committee has acted on it on them before it acted on these bills, uh, but he has not yet approached the uh, Rules Committee to schedule those for the floor. I wanted to ask you about scheduling the bills that have already passed committee for the floor as well as other immigration bills that you plan on considering in the midi committee. Well, I appreciate the gentleman's question, and I share the gentleman's interest in doing immigration reform, all three areas of immigration reform, uh, enforcement, legal immigration reform, which I think would be great for economic growth in our country, and finding the appropriate legal status for people who are not lawfully here. Uh, the committee continues to work uh, on all those uh, areas, and uh, there are uh, uh, large issues beyond the control of the committee. Uh, the committee has uh, thus far uh, completed work on four bills, uh, and I know the Homeland Security Committee has also completed uh, work on one bill. We look forward to uh, continued work, and we hope that uh, at some point, these bills can be brought to the floor. And I do hope that the uh, I do hope that the chair can uh, bring those um, 
uh, important solutions and, and, and more meaningful bills to the floor, and there's actually a reference point to these bills. Um, I'm a non-attorney. Uh, I think there are several non-attorneys on this panel. Uh, I'm not alone. So uh, my comments are a little bit different than some of the, uh, the legal nitty-gritty. I'm just trying to understand this. So uh, the two go together, these bills. One is a report to Congress when the President decides uh, to engage in, in selective enforcement of, of, uh, of something. Uh, the other then allows Congress to act uh, through a civil mechanism to presumably force the hand of the executive. So <laughs> I'm thinking of two instances where uh, this president has had to make the decision to uh, have so, uh, selective enforcement. One is immigration, the other is marijuana uh, uh, legalization or, or the approach to marijuana. And in both those cases, if we say, okay, you know, the president is not deporting 11 million people, uh, why have they made that decision? Well, uh, this body hasn't funded or authorized them or given them the ability to do that. I don't even think that's the desire of this body to see him uh, send 11 million people home. If it is, then this body would fund that and, and give them the tools to do that. So the answer is very simple. If we ask them, they would say, because Congress hasn't, hasn't let us do that. We have with uh, marijuana, my home state, I looked up the statistics. We had a, when we had medical marijuana for a number of years now, we had over 100,000 people had medical marijuana cards. We had, in our first month, statistics for uh, uh, regulated sale, anybody, over 10,000 uh, individuals. So it's somewhere around 110, 120,000 people have, according to our state laws, legally purchased marijuana. Contrary to federal law, a scheduled substance, there's 14 DEA agents in Colorado. Uh, clearly, a decision needs to be made uh, here about what they do. Uh, the president has emphasized that they're going to continue to work on meth and heroin. Uh, if there are illegal activities with regard to marijuana, like selling them to minors, they're going to focus on those. But it's impossible for 14 people uh, to arrest uh, 120,000 people and charge them under federal crime. So, I mean, the simple answer that the federal government, the, the, the executive would give is, well, you're not giving us the tools. If this Congress, and I hope I would oppose this, but I hope it's not the intent of Congress, wants to send 10,000 uh, DE agents to Colorado, it's twice the size of the current agency. I think there are only 6,000 people now. So if they double the size of the agency and send half of the entire staff to Colorado, then maybe they could uh, begin uh, following the law uh, and implementing the law. So it is Congress's fault when we provide the executive with these overly broad, unenforceable mechanisms, and we are delegating power to the executive. I don't see how to read it any other way, because we're on the one hand saying, everybody who uses marijuana, it's against the law. And on the other hand saying, you get 14 DEA agents in your entire state, hop to it. So I, I, I'd like to go to both of you, but I'll start with Mr. Cohen. Uh, how does that even make sense? And isn't it this body's fault with regard to immigration uh, enforcement and with regard to marijuana enforcement that the executive doesn't even come close to having the tools. I, I don't think this body has the will to give him the tools to enforce those laws, frankly. Uh, Mr. Cohen, then we'll go to the chairman. Thank you, Mr. Polis. I, you, you're exactly right. You know, you've got a limited amount of resources. The resources have been cut and cut and cut to sequester, and there's no way that the Justice Department could enforce every law, that the DEA could enforce every law, uh, or that um, ICE could do it either. Uh, you do have to have a system where the administration determines its priorities and the priorities of a, of a rational country. And the marijuana question is, is so interesting because I was, you know, under this theory, of course, the president's supposed to enforce every law, and yet you got a conflict with state law. And, and some of my, most of my colleagues, I think, on the Republican side believe in states' rights and think that states' rights are better, and some folks, you know, nullification and all this stuff here in state legislatures. Uh, you know, what are we supposed to do when you have these conflicts? When the people say one thing, when the states say the same thing, and the federal government's law is wrong because it's, it's cultural lag. It's not in concert with the people in those states, really with the people in the country, but certainly not with state law. And the, in my opinion, you know, it's, it's the right decision by the president not to have the DEA enforce laws in states that have passed medical marijuana or quote, unquote, recreational. And just to follow up, Mr. Cohen, even if the president had not made that decision, would the DEA have anything close to the capacity, the capacity to enforce those No marijuana. way they could do it. No way they could do it. They'd have to, to enforce the marijuana laws. They'd probably have to go in about every other house in America. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the gentleman from Colorado's uh, question. It's a good one. Uh, here's the, the issue before us with this legislation. All this does is uh, allow for, in instances where the Congress has standing, to make it clear that that's, it's only the Constitution that would bar us from bringing a case, not court-made processes, and to have an expedited review of that. So uh, the gentleman raises excellent questions about various types of policy matters that are before the Congress. We have a task force on overcriminalization of federal law, for example, operating in the Judiciary Committee, bipartisan uh, panel that I hope will come forward with recommendations in our criminal law uh, areas, including some of our drug laws. Uh, we have, uh, as the gentleman noted, work on immigration. But it does not help the process of the Congress when the president or another officer of the executive branch unilaterally takes Article I powers and uh, attempts to expand that authority uh, and take care of a whole class of people who are not lawfully president of the United States and that's the subject of a debate in the Congress, and the President says, well, here's what we're going to do, not just to not enforce the law with them, but actually bring them in, give them uh, various status and authority that we don't think the prosecutorial discretion allows. It hinders the ability of the Congress to work on getting the, the changes made because people don't trust that the changes they agree upon and make will actually be enforced and, and by Mr. the executive. Mr. Chairman, I think we, you know, yes, Congress needs to act, so that's only something only Congress can solve. In the absence of congressional action, what else can an executive do besides try to prioritize these things? I mean, what, what else can they well, do? Well, first of all, you don't, you don't make the decision, no matter how many DEA agents, you don't make the decision to not enforce the law at all. Uh, that's a policy change that only the Congress can make. So if you say, well, we don't have the resources, so we're only going to do these limited number of things because that's the resources we have available, that's a good defense on the part of the executive branch for not uh, executing the law as fully as it's required. And remember, the law doesn't say he will do it perfectly. It does, says he will do it faithfully. Uh, and the meaning of that is rooted in constitutional decisions by the Supreme Court and lesser courts. So we as the uh, policy makers in the, the, the legislative branch have the obligation to put forward our authority to make these decisions, and if the president doesn't agree with it, then he can enforce the law as it sits on the books, and that will put, bring added pressure if the public doesn't like the way he's enforcing it to then change the law. But the way he's going about it now, I think, makes it harder for Congress to act, not easier. And it seems to me that when, you know, the law is overly broad and is unenforceable as written, as I would argue both immigration law and marijuana law are unenforceable as written. I mean, perhaps if we became a military state and sent the troops everywhere, they would be enforceable. But they're largely unenforceable as written. That is Congress's fault. It's not this president's fault. It's not the previous president's fault. It's not any president's fault. Congress wrote those laws. Well, if uh, I may, we need it's not entirely Congress's fault that we have – uh, now between 10 and 20 million people unlawfully. Well, Congress failed to secure the border. Well, Congress, Congress failed to implement workplace well, Congress dedication. appropriates and Congress sets the law, but the executive branch is responsible. Uh, and this isn't true of just the current administration, but previous administrations of both parties, I would argue, have not faithfully executed those laws. And we find ourselves in the situation we're in. The gentleman is absolutely right. We need to address it, but we need to address it in the Congress, not by executive changes to the law that the executive branch doesn't have the authority to make. The bipartisan the immigration reform package has $40 billion in the Senate, the one that passed for border security. This body could have, five years ago, ten years ago, appropriated $40 billion for border security. But it, it didn't. Uh, I mean, the well, this body did pass legislation on enforcement, but the other body didn't. So well, we're at the, it didn't become the law. We're didn't become law. So, and now the other body passed it, and we haven't. So we are where we are. We're a bicameral legislature. Uh, they have, both have to pass it to go to the president. Uh, but the issue is you are where you are, um, and any president of any party could only do the most with what, uh, what he has. Um, the risk of this is it actually reduces even further the ability of the executive branch to implement the law fully because it adds additional reporting requirements to them. So those 14 DEA agents that are in Colorado they now have to have additional reporting requirements, presumably, and do even less enforcement of our federal anti-drug laws than they did before. Uh, not that it was meaningful before, given that we have 110,000. We have the files. We know who the 110,000 people are who legally bought marijuana in Colorado. The DA is welcome to look at them. I think they might very well have, and they can go through them. 
and if they have time on their hands, uh, uh, it's their legal ability to uh, to go after those people and prosecute them. Which is, the, however, the administration has said that's a lower priority. Uh, thankfully, uh, in my opinion, uh, but they don't have the ability, even if it was, uh, even if it wasn't the lowest priority. So. This compounds it by adding more reporting requirements to the beleaguered people that are trying to implement these ridiculously broad federal laws, whether it's lack of securing the border, whether it's lack of workplace authentication and immigration, whether it's the, the misscheduling of marijuana on the, on an, uh, with very little scientific evidence to back it up. And I only see this as compounding the problem. Um, Mr. Cohen, is that is that from? This, I'm a non-attorney. Is that uh, am I reading this correctly? And what this does? I don't think you have to be an attorney to clearly see what it is. Uh, and you could be uh, Johnny Nash who can see clearly now. He's well, not an attorney either. Well, and I, I'll give the chairman one more opportunity, Mr. Goodlad. I mean, is what am I coming at this right? Or what am I what am I saying that shows why is this desirable? I mean, this seems to me. <laughs> a very not very desirable thing to do here from the way that I understand it. Well, I think it's a very desirable thing for you and I and every member of Congress to defend Article I uh, prerogatives that the Congress has. Uh, and uh, you're absolutely right. There are many political issues that lie within these policy decisions that leave the president where he is, but it does not give, and you should not give, the president of the United States the authority to rewrite the law and say that if you have 99 employees, you get an extra year to comply with Obamacare, but if you have 100 employees, you don't. But there's nothing in the law about that. Uh, there is a, a whole raft of decisions that are being made in the executive branch that we should take back and make in the in the legislative branch because this is where the Constitution entrusts those powers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I really I really hope that we get to it to fixing the laws so that we're not in this predicament. Um, I uh, am the chief sponsor of HR 499 uh, to legalize and regulate marijuana like alcohol. I'm a co-sponsor of HR 15, the bipartisan comprehensive immigration reform package in the House. I think those two bills would go. Uh, a lot further uh, towards reining in the executive's ability uh, to, to to effectively uh, uh, I impact how laws are implemented by reducing their discretion uh, by solving some of the underlying problems. And both of those bills are under the, the joint jurisdiction or the sole jurisdiction of your committee. Uh, and I hope that uh, you would consider bringing I those forward. Just say briefly, but what if we were to pass those laws? And I agree with some and disagree with others. Uh, but if we were to pass those laws and some uh, president uh, who had a different view of the world than you have, because they're I presumably favorably viewed by you since one is your bill and the other you've co-sponsored, uh, that if they were uh, to choose to enforce those laws in a different way, that's exactly the same thing. The shoe would be on the other foot. So all this does is say to the Congress, you've got... Uh, a responsibility to uphold Article I of the Constitution, and this will give you a more expedited process to have the court step in and say who's right and who's wrong about that. That's all we're doing here. Thank you. And I, I believe when we give an executive overly broad authority, we can only look ourselves in the mirror uh, when determining uh, who to blame. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Stum, gentleman from uh, George is recognized. I appreciate my friend from Colorado's uh, comments. I appreciate him putting his signature where his... Uh, uh, where his mouth and his passions are and being co-sponsors of those uh, bills. And I appreciate uh, the cautionary tale that is uh, you, get what you, you get what you pay for. In this case, you get what you write. You write lousy laws, you get lousy, uh, you lousy enforcement. And there's absolutely a, a, a burden of responsibility that, that, uh, that rests right here with us, and I appreciate you pointing that out. Uh, beyond that, I'm just incredibly disappointed uh, with this today. I, I suppose... Uh, I tell folks, Mr. Cohen, back home that I have more in common with a Democrat from Tennessee than I do a Republican from California uh, because, you know, it has a lot to do with where you live and, and what your values are and, uh, uh, and who, your, uh, who your family and friends, uh, where you go to church, all those kinds of things. And when you started talking, I, I was getting ready to get, give you an amen, right? I, I get frustrated with the process around here, too. I'm saying, for Pete's sake, it's not time to do a subcommittee uh, hearing. Can we not have markups on a regular basis to do all things? Always have to show up at the rules committee that were written uh, yesterday. I share your frustration because I think process matters. And right about the time I was getting ready to get up and give you the amen, 
You went on to, I don't know if you used the word hypocrite or if you just said it was, uh, uh, it was interesting, but you said all these Republicans, they think the idea is a good idea to delay Obamacare, but they just don't like the process that the president's using to do it, and so they're, they're, they're complaining about that, and, and why can't they just be happy with the policy even if the process stinks? Well, the process matters. The process matters greatly. And I don't know why we're not all in the same boat as Article One on this. I, I know you, uh, you read the, the D.C. Circuit opinion on the NLRB recess appointment uh, uh, case. You read the indictment, not just of this president and his overreach, but of this Congress sitting around doing nothing about the overreach of President George W. Bush, of Bill Clinton, of President H.W. Bush, of President Reagan, of President Carter, of President Ford, and beyond. And I don't know how, gentlemen, uh, on the other side of the aisle, my friends, Mr. McGovern, Mr. Hastings, they brought up some very important legislative issues, none of which were in the oath that I took when I arrived here. The solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and bear true faith and allegiance to the same. In that, in that uh, D.C. Circuit Court opinion, and we'll hear from our friends at the Supreme Court soon, and I have no doubt they're going to, to share the very same message, they said it does violence to the Constitution to interpret it as this administration was. And, and so I ask you earnestly, I don't know where you, you were on that. I, I, I know you're, you're an incredibly well-respected member of this body. But in the same way that Mr. Polis has spoken out to say, I think the federal law is wrong, so I'm going to change it. I think we can do better, so I'm going to fix it. When the President made those recess uh, appointments that the Court has now found unconstitutional, did did you also believe those were doing violence to the Constitution, and, and, and did you speak out against, against our president uh, on that issue? First, I'd like to compliment you on understanding the southern word chutzpah. It is hypocrite, but it was chutzpah is what I said, not hypocrite, but you translated it well. Secondly, what I'd like to you know, pro charge process, part of the process where we agree is that the House and Senate need to work together. What this bill only says the House Act or only the Senate Acts. And I think that does really damage to the process of a bilateral uh, legislature and a three different separate and independent branches of government. The legislative needs to work together. Now, the Senate's got certain responsibilities of approving judges and, and all, and the House can go to war. And whatever, but those are set out in the Constitution. Otherwise, we need to act together. And if you don't have but one House saying the President hadn't enforced the law, you get into political issues. If it was both Houses, even though they might both be occupied or majority of the same party, it would be, I think, more in keeping with the Constitution and proper procedure. As far as the other things, I want to thank you for su suggesting that I would have read all of those. Rep I, I can't honestly say, like George Washington, I didn't read them. I know that the chairman is responding to the concerns of members like me who are incredibly frustrated uh, with the lack of, of Article I defense that goes on here. I mean, you're absolutely right. It, 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 you said working together in terms of the House and the Senate. I would have said working together in terms of Tennessee and, and Georgia, right? I mean, when the executive branch uh, uh, does violence to the Constitution, as the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals said, you and I ought to be in the boat together because the violence of the Constitution they're doing is to the Article I section of the Constitution. That's where the violence is, is occurring. And so why is it that you and I can't come together? I just have no doubt that, that for better or for worse, what the chairman's doing here is in response to, uh, to, to, to that concern. That we talk about separation of powers here. That same circuit court decision said, allowing the president to define the scope of his own appointments, his own appointments power, would eviscerate the separation of the Constitution, separation of, of powers. Eviscerate was the word that they but used. But you see, Mr. Woodall, this is where we got a difference. I really think what your argument is, and, and what the argument, this is all coming back to Obama. And this, is, this should be about, if it's about Article I, it shouldn't all go back to President Obama. This should be dealing with these bills here. And yet we're expanding it to President Obama. And that's what we're doing. This whole thing is about, as Mr. Hastings well said, it's about 2014 and Mr. Obama's at a low point and we're going to attack Mr. Obama rather than do unemployment insurance, rather than take care of jobs, rather than infrastructure for the country, rather than make our drug laws sane and sensible. And there's a lot of things we ought to be doing. Immigration, it just, it, it just, it's, it's, it's difficult. When we come up here, we don't come up with the idea of we're going to pass laws and make our country better and deal with the problems. Instead, we're dealing with this, which I did say in committee, uh, quoting Woody Allen, 
from his role as feeling Mellish and bananas, this is a travesty of a mockery of a sham of a mockery of a travesty of two mockeries of a sham. The, I'm, I'm quoting circuit court uh, de decisions. You're quoting Woody Allen. I'm sure there's a there's a, a, a jury uh, who's going to decide uh, who's going to who's going to win that, uh, can I, that. Can I break that tie here? That, that conversation. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, again, I, Mr. Cohen is a well-respected member uh, here. He has the admiration of his colleagues. He is a he is a serious uh, legislator, and he believes, uh, from what he just said, that this is about. President Obama. Now, when I quoted the circuit court, I quoted the fact that this president stepped over the line and this Congress failed to stop him, as did previous Republican and Democratic presidents, as did previous Republican and Democratic Congresses fail to stop them. So I don't, I'm absolutely certain this is not about President Obama. This is about Article I and Article II as lived out over the last uh, five years in the Obama ad administration, but we have instances that we can go back time and time again. In fact, I, I was not here at the time. I, I blame uh, uh, you and members much more senior than you during the Bush administration. Had we done a better job of doing oversight as a Republican Congress over a Republican president, I have no doubt we would not have some of the problems that we're having now. For Pete's sakes, I signed up to be on the Government Oversight Committee this cycle. Uh, that's not a fun committee uh, to be on. I thought it was going to be President Romney, and I wanted to prove that oversight of Article One over Article Two meant not Republican protecting Republican, but Congress doing oversight of the people's power in the uh, in, in the White House. So, it, Judiciary Committee, I know, is also a tough place to to serve. Is there is do you see the foundation that Mr. Cohen sees to believe that this is only about uh, a, a campaign against President Obama as opposed to? fulfilling the oath that you and I took on day one, which was to, uh, uh, to protect and defend? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, I think that both the gentleman from Tennessee and the gentleman from Colorado make a good point that there are lots of uh, legislative issues before the Congress that deserve to be uh, examined. We would probably disagree uh, pretty strongly, and I disagree with the two that they've, they've referred to here. Uh, in what the outcome of that legislation should be. But nonetheless, I don't disagree that uh, uh, there's lots to be done. But you make an excellent point, and uh, someone else did earlier, I think may have been the chairman, that when you pass massive bills and send them to the executive branch, uh, you're often ceding a lot of power over there as well, and you've got to have a check against that. When uh, those bills are not brought back to the Congress, say, okay, we need to repair these instead of finding a way around it, like the President is doing right now with regard to uh, the whole uh, global warming climate change. Uh, issue. These are legislative policy decisions being made by this branch. And I just point out on the excellent example that you cited uh, of the President's uh, recess appointments, wouldn't it be better if this law were in effect when he did that so that we could get an expedited review? Just think of all the decisions that have been made by an illegitimate National Labor Relations Board uh, because there are appointees there who are not eligible to be on the board, and the courts are saying so. Uh, if this expedited process that is in this legislation, which makes no reference to Barack Obama or any future president or any past president, it just simply provides the Congress a way to protect its Article I prerogatives, and that's what would have been really helpful to get that decision made more quickly and get the right people on that well, uh, and to be clear, more Mr. Quickly. Mr. Chairman, I'm not thrilled about this legislation either. I don't want Article Three involved in protecting my Article I uh, rights. We, we absolutely should, as Mr. Cohen said, be able to come together House and Senate. And we have lots of tools at our disposal when we're uh, cooperating in the, same, uh, in the same sandbox. I think it was my colleague from Florida who said w we should be focusing on real rather than imaginary problems. And it is, it is troubling to me that problems, again, not identified by the courts, identified right here, uh, but, but ratified by the courts. And we're, again, we're going to find it the same thing from right across the street here when that decision comes back, is that those of us who swore an oath to protect, to, to, to support and defend the Constitution, not just this year, not last year, not just the last 10 years, but for decades, have allowed the constitutional powers not of, of, of the Congress, but of the people as manifested through Congress to slip away. And, and I, don't, it, I don't know how we begin to work together if we are not equally outraged, both by our failures, as Mr. Polis pointed out, uh, our failures to legislate uh, uh, discreetly, and by our failures to stand up, not as Republicans, not as Democrats, but as Americans, 
preserve the people's power as it exists here because we've never been a nation that was worried about the people having the power. We have always been a nation that was worried about an all-powerful executive. Mr. Cohen? Mr. Woodall, let me ask you this. I, I understand, and I've been a legislator all my life. I've spent 24 years in the state and seven-plus years up here. But don't you think it should have been, if this bill is really right, the House and Senate? Because the House really doesn't have any powers to itself except maybe declare war. There's a few things that are in the Constitution, but there's nothing in the Constitution that says this, and I don't think there's a, a plenary law that says all other things not necessarily taken away from the House can well, do on its own. Shouldn't it have been a House and Senate together? If I might respond to I'd that. I'd be interested to hear uh, the First of all, uh, the case that you cited uh, regarding the Senate's uh, power to uh, advise and consent on presidential appointees is an exclusive power to the Senate. So, so if, if the House has to concur with the Senate in order for the Senate to be able to bring the action, the action that was brought wouldn't have been brought. So, you know, I, I, I just have to say that uh, uh, I, I think that's a, a wrong. Also, the, the thank goodness the House Representatives does not by itself have the power to declare war. Uh, we do not. Uh, we do have the power to originate certain types of uh, tax and, and spending measures, uh, and we might find there would be uh, matters in which we would need to bring a lawsuit over a spending provision that the Senate might not join us. I think we should have the power to do that. Uh, we already exercised that power in regard to uh, defending the defense of marriage case. That was a defensive measure, not an offensive measure of bringing a lawsuit. Uh, but thankfully, the court recognized that if the executive was not going to exercise their responsibility, the Congress, which passed the law, should be allowed into the court to defend the law. And so I don't, I don't agree at all that we should require both bodies to agree to bring a lawsuit. It's only a lawsuit. The court still gets to make that decision uh, about whether we're right or not. And I share your concern about uh, who has the power here, but I will also say that I'm pleased that uh, we did have a court to turn to when the Senate was walked all over with those presidential recess appointments that did not meet the requirements of the law. I hope we'll find our way back. I would never support these measures as constitutional amendments. Uh, I hope they don't have to, to exist uh, uh, in perpetuity. I think they absolutely represent a frustration of, uh, of today, not a frustration uh, with this president in particular, but a frustration with a broken Article I process here. If, we, if, if Robert Byrd was still serving over there in the United States Senate, I would wager these bills would not be on the floor. If Daniel Patrick Moynihan was still serving in the United States Senate, I would wager these bills would not be on the floor because this institution has been characterized by giants who defended country first, constitution second, and party a distant, distant third. I don't know who those giants are. Are there giants like, uh, like Goodlatte and Cohen in the House? There absolutely are. And I, I, don't, I don't mean to minimize that. I, I honestly believe if we had more if we had more opportunities to work together on things like uh, what our majority leader would very much like to bring to the uh, bring the floor, is talk no doubt to the to the gentleman from Colorado about uh, deal with the dreamers issue, deal with these things. You, you, you know, you build those little successes, and you're able to 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 come forward. I talked to a constituent the other day. I think it was uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts who said we ought to be dealing with what our our constituents uh, tell us to deal with. We're talking about immigration. I represent the more more first generation families in my district than any other Republican district outside of California or Florida. And we were talking about immigration, and I said, how are we going to work this out? How are we going to find a compromise? And serious uh, legislator uh, down there at the state, uh, uh, state level said, let me think about that. He called me back the next day. He said, the truth is, Rob, I see lots of pathways forward, but my expectation is the administration is just going to choose to enforce the parts of that uh, agreement that they like, and they're just going to ignore the parts uh, that uh, they compromised with us on, and so I, I really couldn't, couldn't sign off on anything at all. I don't have quite that uh, uh, grim view of, of our circumstance, but I think it's sad that some Americans do. And uh, I know you're not going to be popular on a lot of the blog uh, posts, Mr. Chairman, for bringing this forward. I know it looks like, as it does to the gentleman from Tennessee, uh, a, a partisan attack. Uh, but as we have seen for a generation now, if we don't stand up for the Constitution and Article I powers, nobody else will do, what, do it for us until it is too late. Uh, I'm glad you're not waiting until it's too late, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back his time. Does any other member on the Republican side seek time? Gentleman from Orlando is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to 
reiterate the fact that the House uh, and Senate uh, can operate separately, even in the state level. Uh, in 2008, uh, Governor, then Governor Christ, signed a, a settlement agreement and, and a, uh, a compact with the Seminole Indians on casino gambling, which allowed them to expand its casino gambling on all the native, on all their tri uh, tribal lands in Florida. The House of Representatives, under a writ of quo warranto, which is uh, by what authority, filed a case in the, in the state Supreme Court and won that, saying you don't have the authority, just the House, not the House and Senate together, but just the House, uh, and, and won that. Same Similar situation, um, the Senate did the same thing on another issue where the governor has the line item veto power. Uh, he vetoed only the a dollar amount, but not the language, implementing language that went with that line item. Uh, there was a suit brought under this same, uh, by what authority? By the Senate, state Senate only. And that case went to the state Supreme Court and was won there, uh, where they kept in check the uh, powers, only one body of the legislature in e each case did that and kept in check the executive branch. So I think what Mr. Goodlatte is bringing forth here is, is very proper and has lots of, uh, of legal uh, opinions and other things behind it that would say, could one body do it? Yes, they can. And, and should they do it? Yes, they should, when the executive branch is beyond uh, the, the legal authority. And that, by what authority? By what authority are you doing this? I think that's what you're trying to do. It sounds great to me. Gentlemen, yields back his time. I want to thank both of you for being here today. I, I uh, concur with the gentleman from Florida. I believe that it's incumbent upon every single one of us, whether we represent the president, whether we represent the House or the Senate, whether we're uh, just a, a taxpayer and, and a citizen of the United States, to look at the elected officials of the United States uh, and their designees, as in the executive branch, and try and say, I'd like to comply with the law. I need to know what the law is. And Mr. Chairman, I think that's the basis upon what you brought this up here today as we need to make sure we faithfully and well execute the laws of the United States. And when we disagree with those, we need to find a mechanism to disagree and to notify the American people. I want to thank both of you for taking a good bit of your time for this most uh, interesting debate that took place today. And I know we'll see you on the floor you're both excused at this time. I'd like to now Thank call, you, yes, sir. I'd now like to call the gentleman from uh, New York, Mr. Gibson, member of the uh, the Ag and the Armed Services Committee. And as the gentleman knows, he is uh, well. He is being welcomed uh, to the Rules Committee. Uh, it's not his first uh, turn in the barrel today. And without objection, anything you have in writing will be entered in the record. And the gentleman is recognized. Well, thanks, Mr. Chairman, and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be back with you today. Uh, I'm here today about a topic um, that I visited uh, with you in the past, and it has to do with war powers. As somebody who served 29 years in uniform, uh, multiple combat tours, uh, and as somebody who was researched in this area, taught at West Point in this area, it's an area of great concern. And um, I appreciate my colleagues who I have worked with on this issue here uh, of the belief that over time uh, in since the founding, uh, we've consolidated uh, war powers into the executive branch, and presidents from both political parties have taken us off to war without the consent of the governed. Uh, I had initially submitted uh, two amendments. Uh, I'm going to withdraw one of the amendments, uh, the amendment number seven, which was uh, essentially uh, uh, taken from H.R. 383, of which we have uh, several members of uh, this distinguished committee as co-sponsors the War Powers Reform Act uh, looking to uh, to bring clarity uh, and, and more effectiveness to the War Powers Resolution. Uh, the amendment was initially intended uh, to address some aspects of H.R. 383, but uh, under the advice uh, uh, of some uh, that this would be uh, ruled out of order uh, because it would be changing policy, I'm going to withdraw that. But I do want to focus on amendment number eight. Uh, which is also going to address this area, but explicitly the War Powers Resolution. And uh, Mr. Chairman, in my research on this particular issue with regard to the Enforce Act, 
Since 1982, there have been eight circumstances where this body has uh, brought forward uh, litigation uh, against the administration for noncompliance. Um, either the War Powers Resolution itself or in some cases limiting amendments such as the Bolin Amendment. Uh, now, uh, of those eight cases, uh, in six cases there was a Republican president and in two cases there was a, a Democratic president. I want to quickly uh, list them, uh, the first of which was El Salvador, 1982. This was 16 senators and 13 House members bringing forward uh, litigation. Uh, what I want to um, highlight is that in every one of these eight cases, we never got a conclusion. Uh, these cases were all dismissed. So I do think there's promise in this, admit, this amendment that I'm bringing forward and with the process laid out in the underlying bill that we could very well, I think, see a action that's more in line with what the founders intended, which is, uh, as Richard Neustadt, the political scientist, has said that with regard to, uh, to war powers, we would have separate institutions sharing powers and that we have responsibilities as legislators. El Salvador. Uh, next case was Nicaragua, 1983. This was 12 House members bringing suit. Third case was uh, Granada, 1985. 11 House members brought suit. The fourth case was Iran-Iraq War. This is uh, 1987. The fifth case had to do with the, the Persian Gulf War, uh, the Iraqi. Uh, this was in 1990. In this case, this was 53 House members and one senator bringing suit. The sixth case was the NATO air war in Kosovo and Yugoslavia. Uh, this was under the Clinton administration, 26 members bringing suit. The seventh was uh, regime change and disarmament in Iraq, 2003. This was 12 House members uh, bringing suit. And the eighth case is the NATO-led military action against Libya in 2011. This was 10 House members bringing suit. In none of those cases uh, uh, did we get a, uh, a judicial uh, decision, um, despite the fact that uh, there were members who believed that the president was noncompliant was non uh, with law. So uh, with that said, I think that there's promise here in Amendment 8. It's a very simple amendment. And uh, it, it basically insert after the Constitution of the United States the following. This is into the underlying law, including any case in which the president failed to follow the requirements of the War Powers Resolution. And ladies and gentlemen, part of the issue we deal with, quite candidly, is no president of any party has ever acknowledged the constitutionality of the War Powers Resolution. It's part of the challenge that we deal with. And I think that given the process uh, that's in the underlying bill and this amendment, we will now have clarity in terms of what must be done. And if anyone, a sponsor and co-sponsors, bring forward a bill and it passes uh, in terms of a resolution in a House, that that would uh, constitute standing for us uh, to get a decision from the court on whether or not the administration is compliant or non-compliant uh, with law. So uh, to the ladies and gentlemen of the committee, I respectfully submit the amendment and hope it's ruled in order. I I'll stand for questions. Thank you, gentlemen, for his testimony. Does anyone on the uh, Democratic side have any questions for the gentleman? Gentleman from Massachusetts. Hey, I just want to say I agree with the gentleman, and um, and I and I really I think you know, and I'm 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 critical of this president. Uh, if he decides to stay longer in Afghanistan without seeking authorization from Congress, we have, we've just allowed executive branches of both parties to go off on their own, and it has cost us dearly in terms of blood and in treasure. And uh, so I hope the gentleman's amendment is made in order. Thank you very much, the gentleman. Yields back his time, gentlemen. Seeing none on the Democrat side, gentlewoman from North Carolina is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have any questions of our colleague from New York, but I, I would like to acknowledge three of my constituents who have come into the room from the wonderful town of Kernersville. Uh, Mr. Penix, Mr. Wolf, and Mr. Swisher are here, and I'm delighted that they're here and they came to, um, I'm sure they're in town for the municipalities election, I mean uh, meeting, and uh, they're looking forward to going in to see votes in a few minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlewoman for her time. We would also, on behalf of the committee, thank all three of you for taking time to come up to the Rules Committee. I wish you luck. Uh, you are in the presence of one of the greatest members of the House of Representatives. Gentlewoman is a, a very dear 
defender of the Constitution and freedom, and I know you both, all three, recognize that. Uh, seeing uh, one person, gentleman from Florida, is recognized, gentleman, Mr. Nugent. Colonel Gibson, um, I happen to agree with you 100%. Having three sons that served this country, I, uh, I don't care who the president is or what political party he hails from. I agree with you, and you certainly have the background to talk about what you're talking about as it relates to serving this country. So I appreciate this amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Yields back time. Gentlemen from Louisville, Texas, Dr. Burgess, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I, I just also want to join in with my colleague from Florida and say I agree with the gentleman really thank you for bringing the amendment to the attention of the committee if for whatever reason mr. chairman we can't make it in order this time I hope we will consider taking up this important question before the passage of too much more time because it does need to be answered not just for us but for those who come after us and I'll yield back thank you very much gentlemen you like time uh, mr. Gibson thank you very much for not only taking time to come up to the Rules Committee, you and I have over the years had a number of conversations about your uh, experiences, not only in the United States Army, uh, your service to this great nation, but also in leading young men and women uh, into harm's way and your strong belief uh, about what that courage uh, and sacrifice ensues and the very, very important balance that takes place as your new duty as a member of Congress. And I appreciate you very much. And I want to thank you for taking time. If you have anything in writing, if you'll please make sure that it is left behind uh, so that we remember that in the, the way that you wrote it. And I thank the gentleman. Seeing uh, no more questions from the committee, I will uh, notify the gentleman that he's dismissed at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, we would uh, close the hearing now, H.R. 3973 and H.R. 4138. And the chair will be in receipt of a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 4138, the Enforce the Law Act of 2014, a structured rule. The rule provides one hour of general debate, equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on the judiciary. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule makes an order as original text for the purpose of amendment, an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of Rules Committee print 113-43 and provides that it shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against that amendment in the nature of a substitute. The rule makes in order all those, only those further amendments printed in Part A of the Rules Committee report. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, <coughs> equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment, shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. The rule waives all points of order against the amendments printed in Part A of the report. The rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Section 2 of the rule provides for consideration of H.R. 3973, the faithful execution of the Law Act of 2014 under a structured rule. The rule provides one hour debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on the Judiciary. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that the amendment, the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of Rules Committee print 113-42 shall be considered as adopted, and the bill as amendment shall, amended shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill as amended. The rule makes in order only the further amendment printed in Part B of the Rules Committee report if offered by Representative Ellison of Minnesota or his designee. The amendment shall be considered as read shall be separately debatable for 10 minutes, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment, and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. The rule waives all points of order against the amendment printed in Part B of the report. Finally, the rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instructions. You've now heard the motion from the gentleman from North Carolina, and I would defer to the gentleman from Florida for discussion about that gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The rule provides for consideration of both bills under a structured amendment process. H.R. 4138, the rule makes in order four amendments, all by Democratic sponsors. For H.R. 3973, both of the submitted amendments address the same general topic, and the rule makes in order the broader of the two. This is a straightforward rule for consideration of two very important, important bills, and I urge your support. 
You've now heard the uh, gentleman's discussion of the gentlewoman's motion. Is there further Mr. discussion Chairman? or amendment? Uh, gentleman if from Colorado is recognized. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to submit a statement from Ms. Sheila Jackson Lee to the record. Without objection, that will be entered in the record. I'd like to thank the gentleman for that. And gentleman from Massachusetts I have an amendment, Mr. Colbitton. Uh, Gen gentleman's recognized. I have an amendment to the rule. I move the committee grant H.R. 4138 and H.R. 3973 each open rule so that all members have an opportunity to offer amendments uh, to the bills on the floor. You've now heard the uh, discussion and the gentleman uh, raising the amendment. Those, does anyone wish to have further debate on this? Seeing none, uh, the vote will now be on the Montgomery Amendment. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. No, the no's have it, no's have it. I have another for, amendment. Gen gentleman's recognized. I, uh, I move the committee make an order and give the necessary waivers for the amendment by Representative Gibson, number eight. Um, and uh, we, we just heard the testimony. It clarifies that... Uh, the civil authority provided Congress in the underlying bill extends the executive branch's compliance with the War Powers Resolution. You've now heard the uh, am amendment from the gentleman uh, discussion. Mr. Chairman? The gentleman's recognized. The, uh, what waivers would uh, Mr. Gibson's amendment require? Uh, thank you very much. In fact, uh, it was considered germane. Yeah. Uh, uh, None. Does the gentleman seek further explanation? If the if the chairman had uh, further explanation, I know I know the chairman. In works, fact, I could expand hard. on that. Thank you. I wanted to answer the question the gentleman had, and I thank you very much. Uh, I, th I think it should be noted that uh, th there was uh, seemed to be a healthy appetite in this committee from number of members who, in fact, uh, not only uh, found comfort in what Mr. Gibson was doing, but probably agreed with him. Uh, the determination that uh, I believe this committee has made is that this was being handled by Judiciary Committee when in fact I believe that it would be more appropriate as a standalone bill that might be brought in other committees which have jurisdictional elements. One of them might be uh, the gentlewoman from uh, Florida, Eliana Roslayton, who serves on uh, uh, foreign affairs. Uh, and uh, there are any number of, of what I would call important angles to be considered. Uh, I did that, and I consider that, and so I asked the committee not to make that in order. Gentlemen, seek further information. I thank the chairman. Yes, sir. Further discussion? Seeing none, those in favor of the McGovern Amendment, seek five saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. No. No's have I asked for a roll call Gentlemen, ask for a roll call vote. Ms. Fox. No. Ms. Fox, no. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop, no. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Nugent. Mr. Nugent, no. Mr. Webster. Mr. Webster, no. Ms. Ross Leighton. No. Ms. Ross Leighton, no. Mr. Burgess. No. Mr. Burgess, no. Ms. Slaughter. Aye. Ms. Slaughter, aye. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings. Mr. Polis. Aye. Mr. Polis, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Three yeas, nine nays. The, uh, the amendment is not agreed to. Is further member or discussion? <clears throat> Seeing none, the uh, vote will now be on the motion from the gentleman from North Carolina. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. The ayes have the ayes have it. Uh, I would uh, advise the committee that the gentleman, Mr. Nugent, will be handling uh, this for the Republicans. Mr. McGovern. Mr. McGovern will be handling this for the Democrats. The uh, short straw was extended again. Please be advised the committee will meet tomorrow at 3 o'clock p.m. on the Water Rights Protection Act and the SGR Repeal Modernization Bill. And uh, we now have finished our work for the day.